Good evening. My name is Tim Neff. I'm a Vice President and Director of Museum and Education at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum. I will be serving as the moderator for tonight's program. Soldiers and Sailors is a nonprofit organization located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which stands uh, as a, a unique memorial dedicated to honoring all the men and women of all branches of service from all generations of conflicts. I wanna thank you all for joining us virtually this evening for our Spotlight On program. For more information about our Spotlight On programs, which take place on the second Thursday of each month, you can visit our website to learn more. The format of tonight's program will include a video presentation as well as a live discussion. Let me point out that at the end of the program, there'll be a question and answer session. If you have any questions, please submit a comment on Facebook or if you are watching us on YouTube, please email your question to Soldiers and Sailors Pittsburgh at gmail.com. This year, Memorial Day will be observed on Monday, May 31st, when the nation takes time to honor all of the men and women who have died while serving in the United States military. Originally known as Decoration Day, Memorial Day originated in the years following the Civil War by the, uh, and by the late 1860s, Americans in various towns and cities had begun holding springtime tributes to the countless fallen soldiers, decorating their graves with flowers and reciting prayers. That's where the name Decoration Day comes from. It is unclear where this exactly got started. However, some records do show that one of the earliest Memorial Day commemorations was organized by a group of freed slaves in Charleston, South Carolina, less than one month after the Confederacy surrendered in 1865. That said, in 1966, the federal government declared Waterloo, New York, the official birthplace of Memorial Day. Waterloo, was the, uh, which first celebrated the day on May 5th, 1866, was chosen because it hosted an annual community-wide event during which businesses closed and residents decorated the graves of soldiers with flowers and flags. On May 5th, 1868, General John A. Logan, leader of an organization for Northern Civil War veterans, called for a nationwide day of remembrance. Later that month, he declared that on the 30th of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. Memorial Day, as Decoration Day gradually became known as, originally honored only those lost that were fighting in the Civil War. But during World War I, the United States found itself engaged in another major conflict and the holiday evolved to commemorate American military personnel who died in all wars. In 1968, Congress passed the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which established Memorial Day as the last Monday in May in order to create a three-day weekend for federal employees, and that change went into effect in 1971. That same law also declared Memorial Day a federal holiday. I just wanted to start the program off with that little history of Memorial Day and how it got started and its origins. But moving forward for the rest of tonight's program, we're excited to welcome a video presentation provided by John Heckman, who will address how through the years the fallen have been treated on and off the battlefield. And then after that, we will welcome Michael Krauss, who will share stories about artifacts from the museum's collection that are related to memorializing soldiers and sailors through the years. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, John Heckman. John is an ambitious historian who wants to make a mark not only in the field of history, but in society as well. He wants to pave roads for a living. Now he works to pave the ways for his peers to understand history and the world around them. Thank you, Mr. Heckman. Hi, I'm Paul Lawson, Special Events Volunteer at Soldiers and Sailors. I would like to introduce you tonight to John Heckman, who goes by his brand, the Tattooed Historian. I met John actually a year and a half ago as a Civil War speaker at the local Carnegie Library for a Civil War topic. Take it away, John. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for having me for this amazing presentation evening. I, I'm really excited to be here and to present you with some really interesting information uh, about how we have treated our war dead, those who died in combat, and how that has progressed through the years. Uh, as Paul was saying, I have my brand, The Tattooed Historian, and it was formed to make history more accessible to a new demographic of people and those who have enjoyed history for years. And I'm hoping that this brand will 
help to bring history to the masses for many years to come. Uh, this presentation will be covering how we've treated our, our dead and those killed in action from the Civil War up to the end of the Second World War. We're mainly going to focus on uh, the Civil War, the First World War, and the Second World War. That's not putting anything uh, down with our, our conflicts in the Spanish-American War or anything like that, but we wanted to focus on uh, some of the three major ones, and that's uh, time limiting. That's what we can do this evening. But when we first start to envision how we perceive death in war, uh, we tend to go back to the American Civil War because of the use of photography, of the use of woodcuts, such as the one we see here now. And this idea that transformed society in the 17th century, actually in the 1600s, about the idea of the good death. What's it like to have a good death? What, uh, what does it mean to have a good death? And usually that meant holding your loved ones close or they're surrounding you. You have a proper burial, uh, usually in a church cemetery of some kind or a family plot on your farm. Uh, and it also meant being surrounded by those who cared about you at your time of passing. For example, in the, in the first woodcut that we see there in the top left, we see a famous woodcut made for Amos Humiston, who died on the field of battle, and he was clutching a photo of his children. And that was the way that he was actually identified. Someone found his body, found the photos of the children. They published the photos of the children in the newspapers. They drew up the images. And that's how Amos Humiston was, uh, was identified. So he didn't have to lie in an unmarked grave. Many men, though, would lie in unmarked graves uh, throughout the Civil War, as we know. It was a major issue with identification. This is before dog tags. This is before uh, a lot of people kept a lot of things on them with their name on them. So identification was... Uh, a very hard thing to do in some cases, unless you were found by those who you had served with. And we see the good death scenario playing out in multiple ways, such as Amos Humiston holding his family close the best way he knew how through a photograph of his children, or in this drawing of the deathbed scene of Abraham Lincoln, someone who uh, is wishing for a good death would hope that they would be surrounded by those who cared about them, those who had been with them through life, family members, friends. This was the idea of the good death. And for a lot of Americans during the American Civil War, this was traumatic because for the first time, hundreds of thousands of people are not going to experience this idea of the good death. They're going to be battlefield casualties, such as on the fields of Gettysburg or the fields of Antietam. You're going to see a lot of men in need of burial on these battlefields, thousands and thousands of men. For, for example, at Gettysburg, there's going to be 7,000 killed in action. They are going to need to be buried. They are not going to have that good death scenario, and they're going to lie in graves that mostly are either unmarked as far as names are concerned, or they're in large burial trenches. And we see this at the Rose Farm in Gettysburg. We see Confederate dead who had fought and died in this area on July 2nd, possibly early on July 3rd, and they are being buried in mass graves. Uh, certain ones are lined up for burial by their own men before the Confederates are pushed out, and therefore they're identified. Some lie unknown. Uh, the photo that we see there on the left from the Rose Farm is taken a few days after the battle, and these men still lie in open graves. One thing that allows uh, people to bring their loved ones home, in many cases for the first time in, in combat history in North America, is the embalming process. If you had the money to do this, this allowed you to bring your loved one home. And this is the first instance where we see this in the field. 
at certain places, especially in the Eastern theater of war, where people can have that closure that they wished for during the good death. Their loved one was coming home. Their loved one was gonna get a proper burial. And this was very, very important to them. But this aspect of the good death is a stranglehold on America for so many years. And it's turned on its head by the American Civil War because so many people don't experience the good death. So many families do not have closure. And this impacts how we see battlefield death and treatment of the dead for generations to come. This goes into even the First World War era. Uh, some of these ideas progress into the First World War where we want a proper burial. This goes back to the good death theory, the good death ideal that we see coming up in the 1600s. We still have it today. We still hope that maybe we're gonna die in our sleep peacefully. Maybe we're going to die with those whom we love are standing around us while they're standing around us. This is part of this idea that's been taken up. And when we see battlefield burials, and sometimes in mass or decorated with shells or helmets, we see the comrades standing around with each other. This is a very, very important component to how we perceive death, how we perceive a proper burial. And I want you to remember that this happens on a tremendous scale in the First World War. We may have, quote, only been involved for maybe 18 months on the Western Front and in other places such as the Siberia later on. But still, we have over 100,000 killed in action in a very, very short amount of time. The largest campaign in U.S. Army history is during the First World War. The bloodiest month in U.S. Army history is during the First World War. So it's not during the Civil War. It's during the First World War. And so there's going to be a tremendous amount of burials that have to occur. And you can see it here where you're having a battlefield burial. You have the cemetery in San Miguel and the men waiting for the burial in a warehouse, waiting to be taken to one of these U.S. Army cemeteries or U.S. cemeteries, I should say, on the Western Front, mainly in France. And what happens from this is something that is politically expedient at the time. Secretary of War Newton Baker wants everybody identified. It doesn't matter. He wants everyone identified. They know what happened. They knew what happened during the American Civil War where people weren't identified. Loved ones didn't have closure. Families didn't have closure. They want everyone identified. But it doesn't work that way in war. There's usually going to be those missing in action. Unknown burials are still going to occur. And this leads us to the tomb of the unknown soldier, why this transpires. This comes about because the Wilson administration ends, Warren G. Harding comes into power, and his secretary of war decides we can't do it this way anymore. We must have some way of representing those who died on the field of battle and cannot be identified. So let's transport ourselves to October of 1921. It's nearly three years after the last gun fell silent on the Western Front. And you're going to see this progression of how we see death. There were four candidates for the honor of being entombed in the tomb of the unknown soldier. These four had been disinterred from cemeteries in Ein Marn, the Meuse Argonne, the Psalm, and San Miguel. The honor of choosing who would be the unknown soldier in the Tomb of the Unknowns fell to an army sergeant named Edward Younger. Now imagine being Edward Younger. Four identical caskets are placed in City Hall in Chalon sur Marne and a band has struck up a hymn, and you, Edward Younger, have to choose who is going to be the unknown soldier, forever entombed in the tomb of the unknown. Younger has sprigs of white roses. 
And the French and U.S. delegation has actually taken the four caskets and has moved them around. So you don't know which cemetery they may have come from. And Younger makes his way around peering at each one of the caskets and finally lays the roses on one of them. And that is the person chosen to be in the tomb of the unknown. The person to represent over 1,200 who will be unknown from the First World War. On November 9th, the USS Olympia sails up the Potomac River and brings the body to lie in state in the capital. A few days later, the body is moved and the casket uh, is overseen by over 5,000 people on November 11th, 1921, three uh, years after the final gun fell silent on the Western Front. The casket's transported to Arlington National Cemetery, and you can see the construction of the Tomb of the Unknown in the left picture. A postcard of the final Tomb of the Unknown uh, in the early 1920s on the right. After appropriate remarks by President Warren G. Harding and others, other dignitaries, the casket is lowered into place in the tomb and it lies on a base of French soil. And it is there to this day on that French soil. Proceeding into the Second World War, we see the issue of needing to identify everyone as best as possible, uh, reaching new levels, reaching new heights. Uh, new field manuals are coming out on graves registration. Men are being taken from areas of work in the United States where they worked with the dead. Maybe they worked in a cemetery. Maybe they worked uh, in a mortician's office. And they are now going to be placed in graves registration. Because when the Army finds out that you have experience at one thing, they're going to try to plug you into that thing in the Army. We want people in there who know what they're doing, who have handled dead bodies before. Maybe it won't be as psychologically traumatic for some, not realizing that you're going to see death on a grand scale. And we see the soldier on the left who is identifying bodies. He's also getting ready to get personal effects and put them into place because all of those personal effects need to be sent home to loved ones. You will get a personal effects bag Everything in the pockets of the soldier are now taken out and they are sent to a rear line area to be sorted and then sent home. The soldier on the right is uh, constructing and painting wooden crosses. Now, this is a throwback to the First World War. Uh, our men were supposed to have metal crosses when they went, especially into Normandy. The crosses were going to follow the men to Normandy. Imagine being in those first waves at Normandy and realizing that the crosses you could be buried under are coming uh, in a couple days. So think about the, how that psychologically could affect the frontline troops. And then think about how it affects these men. Uh, some of the first burials in Normandy, for example, are right on the beach on Omaha. So these men then have to be identified and then later moved. This is very important work. And as we progress uh, forward, you see how the men are wrapped and basically uh, the, the body bags are almost like sheets. And uh, usually the names are stenciled onto the body bags. You see how men are interred or possibly disinterred with those wooden crosses brought ashore, whether it be in Italy, North Africa, Normandy, in the Pacific Theater, in Guadalcanal, uh, in Saipan, you see this over and over again. And usually they are buried in a way that's pretty much a manner of their surroundings. Sometimes you see pieces of trees being utilized like you would have back during the Civil War. You see branches, you see bamboo in the China Burma India theater. There are different ways to make note of who was there. And those dog tags that you wore everywhere are there for one reason, that's to identify you and to identify your grave. That is the only reason that you're wearing those. And it becomes synonymous with loss. And what we have to remember is the possible toll 
that this takes not only on the men doing the work, but we also have to think about the toll that this takes on the families. And during the Second World War, the U.S. government will give you the option. Would you like to have your relative sent home to you, or would you like them to remain buried with their comrades? This is unheard of uh, at, at the time. Many other countries don't do anything close to this, but the United States decides we're not going to have this issue again with the unknown soldier as best as we can do. And we're not going to have the issue with family separation from their, their deceased loved ones. We are going to try to bring them home. And so you had the option for the first time in history to say, I want my relative who died in North Africa to come back to my home in Maryland or Pennsylvania. It's, it's a really intriguing way of going back to that 17th century idea of the good death. You're bringing someone home to their family. And it's a very, very important thing to remember. So when they come home to these cemeteries, we can visit them to this day. On the left is a cemetery that is in Europe. On the right is Arlington, a section of Arlington. The graves registration men who helped did this for us. They helped us identify our dead ancestors. They helped identify our relatives who gave their all. So we must think about the emotional toll it took to do this kind of work. And I wanna to read to you while we're looking at these two images, I would love to read to you a letter to the editor that I found in the archives when I worked alongside the US Army Corps of Engineers. It was in Liberty Magazine in 1945. It's written by George B. Park of Bridgeport, Connecticut. George was a graves registration soldier and he put it into words that we could surely use in the First World War and maybe to some extent, the Civil War, because he talks about what it's like to do this work. And I wanna read this to you as we finish this part of this evening's presentation. You wouldn't like my job. Me, I'm used to it by now, but that doesn't mean I'll ever get to like it either. My job is to bury the dead after battle. Not very nice to even talk about, is it? Certainly it's not glamorous or adventurous or heroic sides of war, but it's a job that's got to be done and somebody's got to do it, that's me. No, I don't actually do the spade work. There's a special squad that takes care of that. Sometimes we get extra help for this work too. Prisoners, I supervise. Identification tags, letters and papers and trinkets. So many, many pictures and snapshots, ever present images, of the dearly beloved, personal effects, somebody's private life, his love and laughter, his hopes and dreams, his past and his future now no more. Funny how impersonal you can be when you sort over this stuff. Personal effects, I examine them all, make out the necessary forms, sign and send back to field headquarters. That's where they begin the awful bookkeeping needed to notify next of kin. Wonder how many lives will be torn apart by those coldly official telegrams to next of kin. How many hearts will never heal? How many homes will never seem the same? How many mothers, sisters, wives, sweethearts, dads, kids, brothers, God give them strength and courage. Personal effects, always there is something to tell you so much more than his name and number some cherished time-worn talisman from a world at peace, an outdated driver's license, club membership cards, a pocket piece from some long-remembered convention, a pen knife with stars on it for Sunday school attendance. Soldiers, sure, the world's finest fighting men, but underneath it all, just plain citizens, truck driver, salesman, college boy, clerk, office worker, mechanic, farmer, on and on it goes, men who loved to live. Let's get going, gang. Bring up the picks and shovels. Start the row here in the shade and then mark two or more rows here and here. Mark off the spaces, letter the crosses, rank, name, serial number, date. You know the rest. 
personal effects. The chaplain will want to look them over. Why doesn't he come? So many times I've had to do it myself. The Lord's Prayer spoke into a row of crosses with only my gang to hear, and always they look at me with that strange, half-questioning, half-tortured expression that says, must we leave them here alone? Never mind, lads. Someday it will all be over, and we'll go back to a stronger, free America. We know that. But we'll never forget those little broken bits of America's heart we left over here. America's personal effects. Guess maybe that's why the gang always joins in with me. When it gets to the park, it says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. On a job like this, a man has got to have something to cling to, something steadfast. And I would say that George probably speaks for a lot of the men who had the trying task of burying our honored dead. So I wanna thank you for listening to this part of this evening, evening's presentation. And I think that this underscores uh, why we are who we are and who we hope to be. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tattooed Historian John Heckman for all that great information. I know I sure learned a whole lot myself from this presentation and I hope everybody else did as well. I'd like to point out we did have a little bit of uh, volume issues in the beginning of the program. Uh, we will take care of that in post editing. And when we repost this on Facebook and on YouTube, um, especially on YouTube, you'll see the complete version. So you, we don't have to uh, miss out on the beginning of that presentation. We do apologize, um, but that will get taken care of. But we still got to hear the bulk of the presentation and I hope everybody did enjoy that. Um, it is now my pleasure to switch gears and joining us live this evening is Michael Krauss. A well-known Civil War historian, Michael Krauss currently works as curator, historian for Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum. His accomplishments include several historical consultant credits for major films, writing, and narrating the documentary series Min Civil War Minutes and Civil War Life, as well as authoring articles and books regarding the conflict. Michael is also an accomplished sculptor with an impressive resume of historically themed works in bronze. Michael is going to talk about some of the artifacts that we have in our collection that are related to today's topic. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, John. That was a great presentation. There's a lot of information there that um, is, is not often talked about, but needs to be part of our, uh, our experience, our historic and our uh, experience and understanding what happens to, um, to our dead. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to use John's talk uh, and I'm going to tie in artifacts we have here at Soldiers and Sailors um, from our museum collection that kind of um, uh, kind of uh, focus on some of the points he made and, and, um, and you'll see some physical things. And the first thing uh, I want to talk about uh, is, uh, well, well let, me, let me back up here. John used an interesting phrase he called uh, in the narrative that he read, he called it America's personal effects. And that's kind of what we deal with here is America's personal effects. And uh, we'll start out with uh, the first one, which is a uh, story that John told about Amos Humisted, who uh, was found dead at Gettysburg, clutching a photograph in his hand. Well, this is uh, not the actual photo because the actual photo was lost, uh, but the uh, actual photo before, was uh, there were copies made of the actual photo. Remember this soldier died uh, without any identification. John talked about that too, and the need for soldiers to be identified. In the Civil War, soldiers didn't wear any dog tags or any form of identification. If, and if you fell and weren't buried by your friends or, or uh, mates, uh, or had some letter in your pocket, or sometimes they would purchase little pins that had their names on them, then you might be buried as an unknown. And this particular soldier had fallen on the first day's fight uh, near the brickyard uh, in the, in the uh, retreat through Gettysburg. And in his hand, he was clutching um, a tintype photograph. And a, a girl found him uh, with the photograph in his hand, uh, thought it uh, was very touching that the last thing he saw was his children. And um, the photograph was picked up by uh, 
a, a minister and the minister was um, hoping to get the photograph back to the family, not only that, but identify the soldier. So copies were made in 1863 and circulated all around, um, uh, all around uh, to newspapers and, um, and uh, a woman in uh, New York state uh, saw the photograph, uh, realized it was uh, her children. Uh, of course, it was an emotional moment and um, uh, she was reunited with the with the photo and um, her husband subsequently was identified and lies buried at the uh, in Gettysburg in the National Cemetery now. His three kids uh, were named uh, Frederick, um, Frederick, uh, Frank, and Alice. Uh, they had no father, so they uh, grew up in an orphanage in Gettysburg uh, uh, in, in um, graduated from there and then went on to their adult lives. We also have another uh, piece that um, comes to us. Uh, it's a tombstone. Uh, if we could see that next slide. This is in our collection now, you know, why, why would we have a, a cemetery stone? Well, it's an interesting story. Um, some soldiers, uh, when they were killed, uh, most were buried on the battlefield. They were buried hastily uh, in unmarked graves, sometimes in trenches. Uh, sometimes marked graves, again, by a little identification of a piece of clothing or a badge or a letter, um, but primarily unmarked graves. Some who were, who were placed in marked graves, uh, there was an opportunity uh, to send a body home. You could hire a private uh, vendor, uh, an embalmer, uh, to uh, exhume the remains, embalm them, and send them home uh, to the family. And this particular soldier named E.Z. Hall, uh, Eugene Zebulon Hall, was in the 20th Michigan Volunteer Infantry. He was wounded at Petersburg, uh, Virginia, and died two days later. Now, uh, he was, his family uh, had, had uh, put out the money to have him exhumed and bombed and sent home. And from Petersburg to uh, to Dexter, Michigan, in July, if you can imagine the how the temperature in July, and there, of course there's no air conditioning, and the the coffin was uh, on a train, and by the time it got to Pittsburgh, it was not um, not smelling very good, and it actually was making the passengers on the train sick, the putrid air. So they requested that it be taken off the plane, off the train. And he was taken off the train and buried in Pittsburgh. Now, you notice on the stone, it says Easy Hale, not Easy Hall. We like to um, say that that's because of our crazy Western Pennsylvania accent. When they uh, told the stone engraver the name, and it sounded like Hale rather than Hall. Well, due to that, he was lost. His family didn't know where he was for over 100 years. In fact, it was only... Um, through some of his family who was trying to do research uh, back in the 1990s, uh, they contacted us to see whether we had any records. And we just happened to have a volunteer here who was very familiar with the cemeteries in the local area and he recognized the name. And indeed it was Easy Hall. And through that connection, we were able to get a proper stone uh, with the right name on it placed in the cemetery. And the cemetery uh, gave us the misnamed stone so that we could tell this uh, particularly interesting story. Uh, we have some, uh, we moved now to uh, World War I and uh, John talked about, um, about the need for uh, 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 identifying soldiers and, um, and this came about in, in World War I, all soldiers wore dog tags. Now uh, it's true that some, um, some would lose their tags and become unknown. Uh, but this, this is a particularly poignant story uh, about uh, a soldier from McKeesport named uh, um, David Burton Foster. He was a Marine in the 43rd uh, Company, 5th Marine Battalion. He was, the, he was killed at Bellow Woods uh, in, on June 12, 1918 in uh, some particularly hard fighting. Uh, the uh, the Marines were known for this uh, battle. He was the first soldier to die from McKeesport, and he was buried. Uh, he was buried four times. Once by a comrade in the battle who had heard his friend was was killed. He crawled up and pushed leaves and dirt over him. Uh, the second time he was buried in a in a very temporary grave at Bellowood. The third time he was buried 
in a, uh, in a more permanent American grave at Bellow Wood. Now in World War I, John made an allusion to this, uh, our dead were left in France. Uh, they, we, they were not brought back. Uh, there was uh, a feeling that it would be disheartening to the French to see tens of thousands of uh, American dead being uh, carted through their countryside and shipped home. So the decision was made to leave them where they lie. But that didn't sit well with a lot of the families here in, um, in the United States. And uh, there was a great movement called the Bring Home the Soldier Dead League to uh, try to get soldiers brought back. And, and David Burton Foster's father was one of the founders of that, um, of that, uh, of that uh, organization. And through his efforts and testimony before Congress, and a lot of other uh, people who were interested, uh, they were able to, this is after the war was over in 1921, if requested by a family, the bodies would be sent home. Now, uh, you saw on the picture of uh, the, uh, the previous picture that was on the screen, uh, on, the edge of, on the edge there on the left-hand picture is a, a metal strip. And that's actually the strip that came off of um, David Burton Foster's coffin. It's a metal strip that was nailed onto it so his body wouldn't be mixed up with anybody else. It would be unique and uh, it, from Bella Wood and then uh, in its shipment back home, uh, that, that tag remained with it. When he got home, his remains were put in a, a more formal uh, coffin. And at that point in time, uh, he was still dressed in his clothing he was wearing uh, when he fell. Um, and this canteen on the right, this mess kit on the right hand side was with the body and it was, um, it was taken out of the coffin and given to a local VFW post, which was named in Foster's uh, memory. Uh, there should be another slide after this as well. And these are, this is how he, he was memorialized at the time. The certificate on the right with the soldier kneeling in front of uh, Columbia, the, the goddess of freedom, uh, was the certificate that was given to soldiers that were killed or wounded uh, American soldiers by the American government. There was no Purple Heart Medal yet. It would come later and be retroactive, but in 1917 and 18, this is what a family would have received. And from the government of France on the left is a certificate um, uh, honoring uh, soldiers who fell in their fight uh, in France. So these are two uh, pretty important pieces that accompany uh, uh, Foster in, in their ways that he was memorialized during the time. We also have uh, a bottle, um, that which would be an, the next slide. We have a bottle in a box that once sat at, uh, in a VFW post, number 278 here in Allegheny County, uh, with a bottle of champagne in it. And this was placed there by World War I veterans, and it was a memorial to their comrades, but it's called a last, man's, a last man bottle. So theoretically, the last survivor of that post, the, the last World War I survivor, was entitled to take the bottle out of the uh, box and open it up. And this one comes to us not opened, so either the fellow didn't drink or he uh, wasn't able to take his last drink. But another way of memorializing uh, within, within a community, especially within a community of veterans like the VFW. Uh, the next slide, please. Our collection also includes a number of pieces of a, a very heroic soldier named uh, uh, John Joe Pinder. Uh, Pinder was... Um, uh, from the local area, McKeesport. Uh, he graduated high school in Butler, uh, enlisted in Berg, from Burgettstown. Um, he was an older man for, for, um, for, the, for the age of the army. He was 31 at the time the story begins. He was a radio man. Uh, he had already been in all the campaigns in Italy. And on D-Day, he was... Uh, with the 16th Infantry among the very first wave of soldiers that came to Omaha Beach. And uh, as, the, as his ship, his landing craft approached the beach, dropped its front gate down, it was swept with enemy fire, um, killing a number of the men in front. Uh, Pinder jumped over the side in, in that 
in that jump, he was wounded by a, a, a piece of fragment of a shell that tore into the left side of his face. But he jumped into chest high water with a 80 pound radio. Oh, I forgot to say he was an athlete. He had been before the war, a, uh, a baseball player. In fact, he was, um, he had a contract in the minor leagues. So this is important because it, kind of lets you in on his attitude is must do have to have to overcome attitude so he's he's trying to get through the water he gets onto the beach um, gets his radio off sees that um, it was damaged and is missing parts so he uh, takes the opportunity if you could call it that to go back out on the fire swept beach to look for another radio because there are thousands of men landing and uh, there were other radios and he he goes out and finds another radio but in that attempt he's struck by german machine gun bullets in the legs in both legs he he picks up the spare radio drags it back to a place on the beach takes the parts he needs fixes his radio gets a working radio going uh, remember he's wounded in both legs and the face he refuses treatment and um, as the radio uh, begins to work, he's struck by a sniper bullet in the head and killed. Well, that action, um, that his, his action that day, actually it was his 32nd birthday. Um, that action that day was noticed, his heroics were noticed, and he was, um, he was later awarded a, um, a Medal of Honor. He was a recipient of a Medal of Honor. He's only one of four American soldiers to receive a Medal of Honor for June 6, 1944. Two officers, two enlisted men. There are other recipients in the campaign at Normandy, but this is um, actually the D-Day landing. So what you see here is uh, the box for his medal. Um, and uh, John talked about um, the contents, like the grave registration people uh, taking the contents of uh, what was on a soldier. And these are the contents that were actually in uh, Joe Pinder's wallet, uh, which is fascinating to look at uh, because you see him as uh, not only a hero, but as a, as a real person, a picture of his father, a picture of his brother, who was a, a, a B-17 pilot that had been shot down, um, some pictures from home, uh, a playing card, some little uh, membership cards in different clubs, very interpersonal relationship. We, we get an interpersonal relationship by looking at these little objects that had belonged to uh, Joe Pinder uh, when he was killed at Omaha Beach. So we remember him uh, not only as a Medal of Honor recipient, but as a, as a person. And uh, we memorialize uh, his, his uh, memory here. And uh, we were grateful to the family who allowed us to um, to have this medal. In fact, it's uh, right behind me up here on the wall. Um, the actual medal is right there. It's right there in our Medal of Honor display. And um, we, 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 um, we remarked to the family that his name would be spoken. And uh, we at literally talk about Joe Pinder on every tour. He's a favorite of uh, all our tour guides. And I know he's one of Tim's favorite to tell a uh, story as well. So this is a way that we re memorialize uh, this particular soldier uh, in our everyday Soldiers and Sailors Museum. We have um, another set of uh, artifacts, uh, the next slide. Uh, these are, um, it's very interesting. These come from the Gulf War. Uh, there was a small um, reserve, Army Reserve detachment, the 475th Quartermaster Group out of Farrell, Pennsylvania, that went over to uh, um, to Dahrain, Saudi America, Saudi Arabia, excuse me, in the Gulf War, and they uh, were a water supply uh, unit. Uh, they went over to uh, make sure that uh, that the water could be obtained for uh, for the uh, troops that were coming in, um, getting water fixed up for villages and uh, treated water. So they weren't a combat group, but they were only there a little while uh, in a barracks near the airport when a when a Scud missile landed right in the barracks and uh, killed 27 of them and injured 98. This little memorial we have was made by the command sergeant major. Uh, his last name is Svita, 
He's pictured on the right-hand side uh, with the with the sign that says 475th Quartermaster. And these were um, these were the people in his command who were injured or killed. And Svita made this um, small, again, very personal memorial uh, with their names um, and uh, a few little statues and coins uh, that he uh, he kept at his at his home. And we were fortunate enough um, that he donated not only the little memorial uh, in memory of, of his fallen people in his unit, but uh, his uniform and uh, scrapbooks he kept that are uh, uh, very, um, very interesting showing, uh, showing the unit and showing it uh, before the attack and then showing the building after the attack and the damage that was done. So this uh, little memorial now becomes a bigger memorial um, for all of us to look at and share. Uh, it's a homemade memorial, uh, which has uh, a lot of charm and a lot of emotion uh, that goes with it. So uh, these are pieces in summary, um, these are pieces that are in our collection that help to memorialize uh, soldiers who have fallen. Uh, it's, it's a really good way to keep their memories alive. It's a really good way to talk about them, to have them in our conversations, for us to show these personal effects to people, to, um, to generate conversations and, and put them in a, um, in a frame that explains their, their part in history and, and our community. So with that, I just wanna um, also say that Soldiers and Sailors is a, its actual name is Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum. So it is a memorial in itself and uh, we house a lot, of, um, a lot of memory here. And I would say if you're ever nearby Pittsburgh and, and wanna, wanna stop that please do and we'd love to have you visit. With that, I'll turn it back over to Tim and uh, see if we have any questions. Thanks, Mike. That was really great. Uh, thanks for sharing all those stories that uh, I'm very used to telling on tours that I give all the time. And I'm really glad that you tied it back to Soldiers and Sailors, because that's really what I wanted to uh, bring up, is that's what Soldiers and Sailors is all about, is, as its origins as a Civil War memorial to honor the approximately 25,000 men who served in the Union Army from Allegheny County. Um, at this time, we'd be happy, especially uh, for if anybody has any questions for Michael, um, you can post them in the uh, comments section. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, I will look here to see if I have any questions coming up. I'm not seeing any right now. Please feel free to if you'd like to. In the meantime, though, while we, we have your attention, oh, here we go. Um, we have a question here, and I don't know if we'll be able to answer this or not, Michael, if you, can, if you know how much was the embalming. Do you have any idea about that? No, I, I'm sorry, I don't. I've read it. I've read it. Uh, you can actually see ads in uh, Civil War newspapers in the back pages, and in, uh, in uh, you know with quotes of prices. And I know that some embalmers were brazen enough that as troops marched off to battle, they would pass out their business cards. So that's kind of um, a little bold, but uh, there are stories that uh, uh, that that show that these men were. Uh, they were providing a service, but they were also opportunists. Thanks, Mike. Do we have any other questions from our audience here? I, I really want to appreciate every, we really appreciate everybody tuning in this evening. We have some very nice comments about the program. Once again, I'd like to reiterate that uh, we will fix the audio issues on the reposting um, online so that when we go uh, on Facebook and YouTube, when it's archived, that you'll be able to see the very beginning of John Heckman's uh, speech. Um, so I guess with that, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to just say thank you to our presenters. Thank you to all those who tuned in. I'd also like to take a moment to point out that on this Memorial Day this year, on May 31st, 2021, Soldiers and Sailors will be hosting a virtual Memorial Day program. At 11 o'clock that day, you can tune in on our regular uh, links here on Facebook and YouTube to learn all about, um, you know, to see, I should say, a ceremony that we will be having in our auditorium to honor Memorial Day. It'll be about a, I'd say about an hour ceremony followed by a slideshow that we have that honors fallen soldiers from post 9-11 era um, that we play every year um, after our Memorial Day ceremony. So that will all be virtual this year. Please note it is virtual. 
um, and then uh, you can tune in and, and watch that live with our um, with with the live streaming that we'll be doing that day. And that, like I said, will be on Memorial Day at 11 a.m. At this time, I'd also like to point out um, that we have some information available to you if you'd like to learn more about soldiers and sailors. And of course, our Memorial Day program and everything else coming up, you can go to our website, soldiersandsailorshall.org. Um, and also for the tattooed historian, you can uh, to, uh, find him on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitch. He's all over the place. Um, and he also has a podcast, The Tattooed Historian Show, which you can find on iTunes and other podcast apps and websites. So I really hope you take some time to um, you know, find out uh, more about John and, and all the efforts that he does and that he works for. Um, I s just see here another question maybe came in. I am not familiar with this, Michael. Do you know of, uh, he, I, we have a question here I've read recently about all the thousands of unidentified photos of Civil War soldiers. Do you have any of these photos on display? You might be referring to uh, what's called the dead letter photos. Uh, during the war, there were um, a lot of photos that were placed in the mail and uh, uh, were, not were not received and they were put on these large boards uh, and people could claim them. Um, we do not have any of those in my, in our collection. I'm very familiar with them. They are uh, very collectible and a lot of photo historians avidly seek them out. Um, the boards, for the most part, there are only one or two boards that I know of that are complete. When I say a board, it's a, it's a poster board about this big and so tall and maybe has uh, 70 or 80 pictures on them. All, all kind of pinned together. Um, there's only one or two that I know that are complete. For the most part, they've been taken apart and those photos are easily identified by uh, the hole where the, the pin went on the top and the bottom. It was like a, like a paperclip pin that went through them. Um, but no, we don't have any in our collection, but I am very familiar with them. Thanks, Mike. And we have one more question here that we'll look at and um, looking for records on Purple Heart recipients. Um, do you know what, do we do we have anything like that, Mike? I know we have a, a book right about Pennsylvania, I believe Purple Hearts, but I don't know this one is talking about California. Do you have any advice on maybe finding any information about that? No, it's difficult. Um, you know, there, yes, there is a book, a Pennsylvania book that we have. And those, uh, it's, gosh, it's three inches thick and it, it just lists, lists names alphabetically and the date of the uh, of the soldier when he was wounded. And sometimes it'll remark whether he was killed or not. Um, um, we don't, I don't know of any, any similar books for other, other states. And it's very difficult information to find and compile. So um, I, I don't know how to, how you would do that other than just a web search. Uh, it's, it's, again, it's difficult, and, and I, I don't know what war, um, what war you're referring to. World War One, you might stand a better chance because there were some books published. Uh, although I don't believe, I don't believe Purple Heart was a medal that was included in there. Distinguished Service Cross, uh, Medal of Honor, uh, those are those are in the World War One book. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, that there are any other books other than the Pennsylvania one that we have in our library. Well, I see here she followed up to say that he did live in Butler. So if you want to um, email yeah. us, yeah, if you want to email us about that information, um, we'd be happy to see if we can find any records in the book that we have about the Purple Heart from Pennsylvania. Uh, I also saw one last comment, and I'd like to acknowledge um, about uh, David McCusker, who is um, uh, an inductee in our Hall of Valor program. I do remember his induction in 2017. Um, the Hall of Valor is a way we uh, remember and in a way memorialize uh, soldiers who have received the Silver Star, the Distinguished Cross, or the Medal of Honor. We have over 700 total inductees in the Hall of Valor. And people who visit the museum can pull those up online on a computer kiosk, I should say, and see the, uh, see the plaques that are created each year. Just this past March, we inducted uh, 11 new members into this um, um, Hall of Valor program. So we're very honored to have that program and another great reason to visit soldiers and sailors and learn about all these local heroes. Uh, of course, Pinder, who was mentioned earlier, is also in there as well. Okay. So at this time, I'd like to conclude the program and just say thank you all so much for joining us. 
Next month, we will be back on the second Thursday with Spotlight on Pittsburgh Stories from D-Day. Of course, June is the, the anniversary of D-Day, so we will be highlighting some of the local connections and local stories related to D-Day, and that'll be on Thursday, June 10th at 7 o'clock. Same bat channel, same uh, place to find us. And at this time, I'd just like to thank everybody, and we look forward to virtually seeing you next time. Take care, everybody.